An outstanding second half effort comes up just short. Welcome back to the Falcons Audible. I'm Derek Rackley. This is presented by AT&T. We got DJ Shockley as always. And we've got Dave Archer in a different locale today. Oh, Arch. We've got Arch joining us from the West Coast. Ooh. Dave, how are you doing? Dave is out in Seattle with the uh, Falcons team as they practice all week out on the West Coast. Getting up early. Yeah, yeah. three-hour thing is a no joke, right? I mean, <laughs> you're used to the East Coast time, so three hours earlier is a, is a little bit different. But no, we're, uh, we're here in Seattle where the University of Washington is where the team will practice this week. Uh, spend some time at, at UW and, and get ready to play. Maybe some of that well, Washington Husky stuff will rub off on us because they've been pretty good this year. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get uh, a little bit of Dave's flavor of how things are going on the West Coast, and we'll talk a little bit more about how West Coast trips are for NFL teams, for players, for personnel that have to spend the entire week out there, um, and how they rebound from a difficult loss. And we will talk about that before we get into it real quick. Here is what we were going to be discussing today. First reactions, DJ, we're going to talk about what impressed us because there were some things that were not so good but there were also some things that were impressive and we want to talk about the positives as well first half versus second half what changed for Atlanta how they were able to get back into the ball game late as it uh, rolled on we will also talk about what they need to do to turn the page on that game moving forward to this game against Seattle of course that's where they're uh, practicing uh, this week and then as I just mentioned story time we'll talk a little bit about uh, our experiences having to play a West Coast trip and what it's like having to go across the country and get adjusted and practice in different locations when you don't have all the things that you're used to. So we'll get into a little bit of that. So, Dave, I want to start with you since you woke up early. You told <laughs> you told Alexa to set your alarm to wake you up much earlier than what you anticipated. There was plenty of mistakes that went on in the game last weekend but we want to start by talking about some of the positives because there was a lot of good things that came out of the performance again you were there talk about some of the great the positive things that you saw that they can potentially lean on moving forward well i think that this team is a pretty intelligent team and by that i mean their ability to absorb game plans this is a really young football team uh, one of the youngest in the national football league and you guys know this and try to, to tell our fans out there about how difficult it is to shift gears from week to week when game plans change. Um, if you're a young team, that might be a little bit different because you're so or a little bit more difficult because you've got guys so ingrained in the game plan that week. Then a lot of times you guys know the game plan shifts dramatically the next week. And this is a team that's been able to handle uh, a good bit of that and the reason I say that is because of what they did to Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald is, the, is a game wrecker, we know, uh, arguably the best player in the National Football League. I mentioned his name one time in the game, um, and that's that's saying something uh, because they had a plan for Donald to get him blocked. And I got a chance to sp spend some time with, with Arthur Smith, our head coach, and he showed me some of the intricacies of what they were trying to do. And – whether it was the extra offensive lineman, whether it was the running back, they did a really good job of absorbing that part of it. And I think that bodes well. Why do I mention that? Hey, we lost the game. Yeah, Donald wasn't a factor, but we still lost. What it tells me is that you've got a team that can adapt from week to week. Because remember week one, it was Cam Jordan, right? We needed to get Cam Jordan blocked. We need to make sure that we take care of DeMario Davis in the interior. They were able to do that for the better part of three and a half quarters. So I like that part of it. I think it's a team that can adapt, shows flexibility, and I think you're seeing some of the young players now starting to merge. Drake London, we've seen we've seen Tyler Algier now. I think some of these guys are going to start emerging as some of the, the depth and the core of what this team's going to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Dave, because as soon as you said Donald, I mentioned his name one time, I went back to our podcast last week because he said the same thing. When he was talking about the game against the Saints, he said, I mentioned Cam Hayward's name one time, yeah. right? So that is a positive, DJ, because if you can game plan and find a way to take away one of the most explosive weapons, whether that's offensively or defensively, and, and basically neutralize them, maybe they make one or two tackles, but they don't take over a game, yeah. which is what some NFL players can do. That's a positive. What other positives did you see out of the performance? You know, I, I think there are two that uh, that kind of stand out for me. And Archie don't want them. Um, it's the amount of uh, – the production that we had with our rookies. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, we know Drake had a big game and targeted 19 times in the first two ball games. Uh, you mentioned 
Troy Anderson with the big block. I mean, I mean, how big was that? Tyler Algier getting, you know, 10 carries in the ball game, wasn't up for the first game. Now he's up. And give a lot of credit to, to the staff of Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot and the, you know, scout staff that, you know, you got rookies coming in here and they're playing early. Usually it takes, you know, eight, nine games to get a guy acclimated to, you know, NFL ball. But you got guys that are actually producing early in the first two ball games. So that's one thing that was impressed me, that we got rookies that are showing up early for us. And that's going to pay huge dividends down the road. The other thing that was impressive to me was when – you put all three phases together, mm -hmm. this team can actually, you know, it, it had signs of what you expect it to look like. We saw times where the offense was moving the football up and down the field. Archer talked about being able to block a guy who a lot of teams are, quite frankly, scared of and find a way to, to lose a ball game with him there. But they said, hey, we're going to go right at him. We're going to find a way to block him. You did that defensively. How many times you got the ball out? Yeah. I mean, turnovers, you did a good job of that. We just talked about the block punt. So I thought all three phases show what this Falcons team could absolutely look like when each and every guy is doing their 111. And that's one thing that I know. Arch, Rack, I know we all heard that. Do your 111. And I thought all three phases uh, had their opportunities to show that. And if you can do that for four quarters, you got a chance to be a really good football team. There, there are so many positions. Maybe the quarterback is the one that probably actually can do more than 111th because he controls so much on the field. But you're right. The fact that I'll do my job, you do your job, we're going to count on each other to take care of things. Yeah. Um, and so you're starting to see some of that. You talked about the special teams play. I had to write this down. 509 games since the Falcons, they said this during the broadcast, last had a block punt return for a touchdown. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Troy Anderson with the block. Lorenzo Carter scoops it up and scores. Then they end up with a two-point conversion to Drake London. You mentioned one of the things that I was going to talk about, the positive, was the takeaways. Yeah. Continuing to find a way to take the football away. Yeah. Now, we also have giveaways. On the other hand, that's kind of plaguing us. But there was so much criticism, so much pressure on this defense to take the next step forward. The win-loss record not necessarily showing it, but we're starting to see some pieces. You talked about the rookies, even on the defensive side of the ball, chipping in. But the takeaways are going to help them win games down the road. Yeah. It's not so great right now. Right. We can't sit there and talk about victories right now. Right. But there are pieces to the puzzle that are there that we have to continue to start building on, and that's what's going to end up resulting in W's down the road. Rack, I, I want you to kind of break down this for the fans because obviously the big play by Troy Anderson, the block – You've been in that spot before where you're that guy right in the middle, and fans are like, how does he come right through the middle? I would love for you to break down how hard it is first to, you know, be able to get that block, but what went through in that, that sequence of uh, those guys being able to get that block? You know, it's so interesting because when I see the blocks that come up the middle, I always go back, and oddly enough, the, my special teams coordinator was Joe D. Camillus, still yeah. on the sidelines with the Rams, um, and I go back to the protections that we used to run, and I say, okay, here was the look. Yeah. How, why did it get blocked? And then you look at it, and it's generally either in alignment. Somebody gets too wide, right? right? So it's somebody right next to the long snapper gets too wide. He gets stretched out, uh. which opens up a seam. Or there was a lack of communication between who the long snapper and who the personal protector is going to block. Uh. And you're right. It's difficult because in the NFL, the long snapper on a block look is generally responsible for a rusher. Yeah. Whereas in college, they just kind of try to mull it, muddle it up or, or let the three big guys that are standing 10 yards back just try to pick somebody up mm -hmm. but in the nfl you're responsible for a guy and you not only have to make a perfect snap going back but you've got to get back off the line of scrimmage and get into your blocking responsibility which is either just to your right or just to your left not to mention get your head up because your guy might start on the right and end up on the left by the yeah. time you pick your head up man so there's a lot of stuff that goes through it through the head of a long snapper not only just executing that snap and the reason i ask that is because arch understands this as much uh, as anybody as a quarterback when you get a blitz up the middle we're always taught the offensive line has to take the most dangerous you got to mm -hmm. take the guy that's closest to the quarterback and get that blocked up first let the guy come off the edge because he has a further way to come to get to the quarterback and for me I'm thinking about it is how intricate was the design for the Falcons to be able to get that mismatch and it just shows the creativity from the special teams coach yes. Marquise Williams to draw something up 
where you can go get a block. So that I just thought it was interesting that we talk a lot about offense, defense, and scheme wise, but here's a, a play that that direct correlates to the special teams that's drawn up to go get a big play. And one thing I, I will tell chance, you, I had a chance to talk to Troy yesterday, guys, about the play, and and um, it's a complete blow by Seattle. They they uh, you know there's no there was nothing. I think they obviously they had an overload to one side of the one side of the formation. The personal protector peeled to the right to block just outside the punter. The center blocked back and left Troy Anderson straight through the middle. Nobody touched him. Um, but I thought what was important and something that Arthur Smith brought up in his presser was the poise Troy showed because he he showed the great quickness and speed of why you drafted him. The guy ran what four four at the combine and he got through that quickly. But you guys know as well as I do, and Rack, you've been in these in the meetings before. You got young guys that'll overrun the play, mm-hmm. that will actually run past the punter, and the punter will still get the ball off. And so he had a decision to make. He got there so quickly. Do I tackle the punter? <laughs> yeah. Do I play the ball off of his foot? And obviously, he played it perfectly. He put his hands right on top of the ball. Is the the ball hadn't even hit the kicker's foot yet? Um, so it may look like it's an easy deal and rack you've been talking about and explaining it. You might go into a little bit more in depth in in that's something they work on in taking the ball off the foot, go to where the ball's going to be, not where, you know, where the ball is at that time. There's some intricacies there that I thought Troy Anderson did a great job of executing. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I could sit here and it's like, how long do we have to go through all the different (laughs) intricacies of special teams play? But you're right. There's always a block point that's actually studied by the special teams coach the minute you come into the meeting. He says the way that this punter approaches the line of scrimmage after he catches the ball, his Mm. block point is nine, nine and a half, ten yards, something like that. And then you're right, Arch. Once you get there, once you get your opportunity and the eyes get wide open, you start (laughs) slobbering all over yourself. You can't just jump in the air and fly through and say, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get you could just run right over the ball. That's why you have to have the poise. You have to understand that you take your hands right to the block point and try to literally catch the ball off the punter's foot. Every once in a while, a guy will jump in the air and he'll get lucky and he'll block one. But how many times do we see guys jump in the air and they completely whiff on a block punt when they should have took it right off the foot. So it's great that you mentioned that. That's that's all up in my element. Like I said, <laughs> uh, our producer Sam would get very upset because I would take uh, the entire 30 minutes and talk about special teams play. But we want to get into a little bit of the differences between the first half and the second half because it was a loss for the Falcons. And yes, they made a great comeback in the second half. But Arch, you were there. So t- kind of walk us through the differences in the first half and the second half. We we. We know that they made a great comeback in the second half, but why did they have to do that? What set that up with their play or lack thereof in the first half? Well, I think that you, if you're going to point to the offensive side of the football, it's just your inability and if inefficiency in the red zone. You've got to be able to finish drives, and you're not finishing drives. The opening drive, very much like the game against the Saints, you drove the length of the field, and then you have you short circuit. You have an offside penalty. A guy moves. The snap didn't come back. I think it got blamed on Lindstrom, but everybody moved. Dalman didn't snap the ball. So you've got an illegal procedure penalty and then you move it back. And now you've got a blown assignment up front. They slide the line to Donald. Nobody picks uh, Magu- uh, Wagner coming through the a gap and Wagner gets a sack and bang, bang, you're kicking a field goal. Then Koo magnifies it by missing the field goal. So just inefficiencies when you get down in the red zone, I think they now have what shock four or five red zone penalties yeah. that have changed the complexion of the play call and it kind of puts you up against it to try to execute down there. To me, that's where it all boils down. Your ability, when you get down, you're getting down there. They're moving the football. They're doing some good stuff from 20 to 20. It's when they get in the red zone that they don't they don't take care of their business. They don't emphasize – they're emphasizing it, but there's not a sense of urgency shock to get the job done when you've done all that work to get it down there. So now get the ball in the end zone. To me, that was what was glaring in the first half. The Rams were a problem on an offense. We knew they were going to be a problem. They do a really good job of the short passing attack. I thought Atlanta did a, did a decent job in the second half adjusting to matching when they wanted to come with zone pressure. They play a kind of a man concept within their zone pressures where they match up. It almost becomes almost a man in your zone. They didn't think they did a very good job of matching in the first half, and they did in the second half. They did a better job of making Stafford maybe come off of his first read, and they turned him over. 
So that changed in the second half as well. Chuck, I want to go back to what Arch was talking about with the red zone because I think there's probably a lot of people watching or listening right now that may not understand why it can be a struggle, not only for Atlanta, but for any team when they get down into the red zone, right? So we always talked about different red zone keys because the field shrinks sure. when you get down into the end zone or into the red zone. You talk about no penalties. Arch just talked about that. You talk about no sacks. Arch just talked about that, right? These are all red zone goals that teams set out as far as they set that out in training camp, and you have to execute these things as you get throughout the season. Face mask or higher when you're throwing to your teammates, right? Mm -hmm. But I want you to explain as a quarterback and for people that are listening and watching what it's like when you feel the field shrinking when you get down in the red zone. Uh, it's It's – you almost have an extra defender. You mm -hmm. actually do once you get down in there. I mean, you got 11 guys on the field. You got that back end line. As for DBs, they know they have that back end line. So they use that, especially in the end, in the red zone, as, okay, I don't have to back up as much because nobody's going to get behind me because I got that end zone. Yep. So that ultimately makes the field shrink. And then a lot of times, once you get inside the red zone, regardless, sometimes it depends on situation or down a distance, defense are looking at the quarterback. Mm -hmm. They play what we call the four cross, and everybody's sitting on the – maybe, you know, if you're inside the 10, they're sitting on the goal line, and they're looking at the quarterback. So they see everything in front of them, and they see the quarterback. So it makes the windows a lot smaller, yep. and it makes it a, a lot harder to throw the football down there. And that's why teams always emphasize, if we can run the football in the red zone, that opens things up for us really, really big. And then, like you guys just mentioned, penalties, you know, getting you off schedule, those things hurt you when you get down there because now you're playing into the hands of the defense because now you're trying to force the football into the end zone or you're trying to pick up those yards you just lost, and that's when mistakes start to happen. And I, I think that's part of the, the red zone issues that the Falcons were having, especially early in that ball game, is you're having some issues once you got down there that – ultimately snowballed into bigger things. And I think, you know, going back into the first half and thinking about the second half, another big thing was third down. Yeah. You were in a lot of situations where you were third and seven plus, and then there were a couple of instances where you had third and one or two, and you tried to run the football and couldn't pick it up. Mm -hmm. So those are things that, that can stall a drive or can stall the momentum when you're not picking up those third. I think the Falcons were three of ten on third down in this ball game. That gives the defense a lot of credit where you can get them off the field in, a, in those situations. Um, but I go back to the second half, and I think about – I remember Casey Hager talking after the game, and he talked about, to, to Archer's point of them playing match coverage. He said in, the, he said in his post-game press that there was a time when he got his interception, Stafford thought he was going to fall off on another route, but because this particular route was in his zone, he just stayed with him. And Stafford threw it anyway, expecting him to do something else. Mm -hmm. So this is a guy who's a veteran who's done it. He's been there. He's played against Stafford a number of times, and he knows how he thinks a little bit. But the fact that each guy did their job, and it goes back to that 111. I go back to an example of Michael Walker's interception. Yep. Michael Walker, they get play action. He actually steps up into the line of scrimmage, but then once he sees it's not play action, guess what he does? He turns his head, looks up the route behind him, and then finds the quarterback – and looks it up and makes an interception. That's what's called doing your 111. You do your job. Yeah, I saw play action. I stepped up, but then it wasn't what I thought it was. I got into my my particular hook zone area and found the football. Yep. That's a big time play. I, I, the the London touchdown. It's in the red zone. But this is all by Kyle Pitts. He does such a great job of going vertical at the guy who's covering Drake London, and it's a one step slant. But because he goes vertical at him and then gets vertical, the guy has to pump his brakes a little bit, has yep. to pump his feet, and now he's behind Drake on that one-step slant. So these are the one things, these are some of the small things inside the game. And when people ask, where's Kyle Pitts? Well, he's affecting the game, trust me. Yeah. He's gotten dudes open. He's made a couple big catches for, you know, Drake London because of his presence. But those are small things, details that I talk about. You say you're doing your 111 that you don't really see but it happens in a ball game. And, and, I'll, and I'll piggyback on that, Shock. The fact that Kyle Pitts made it look like a route. Yeah. How many times, especially younger players, 
when they know that their responsibility is to rub off the defender covering a receiver, right. they basically just go up there and run into the guy, for right? Sure. And it's an easy call for yeah. offensive pass interference. Yeah. But the fact that Pitts got vertical and then he made it look like a route, it wasn't like he boxed out the defense, but right. if you can get them to trail for just a half a step and or one step, need. it's over. Yeah. That's all that the quarterback is looking for. So, Arch, I want to come back to you. Not only expand a little bit more on the second half, but maybe talk since you were there – how the atmosphere inside that building changed once the Rams thought this insurmountable lead was starting to slip away and Atlanta was getting back in the game. Well, first of all, guys, it's just an indication of how hard it is to win this league. I think that everybody points when we're Falcon fans, we point to maybe some of our failures late in games to close games out over the last several seasons. But if you looked around the league this weekend, it happened everywhere. I mean, there were, for what, three or four te- games where teams were Miami. down double digits and yeah. came back to win. Other team came back to win. Um, it's just the way it is. It's it, You get in some kind of rhythm. And, and, and But from a building standpoint, it was a, it was a good building for the Rams. They had, they had a good crowd, obviously got off to a great start, got the big lead. The interception was huge. I thought that was a big moment in the game um, for the Rams. The, the Falcons get the ball back down 14-3. They're moving the ball. They get out near midfield, and and uh, Marcus tries to shoot the ball in the left flat to CP, and it gets on him a little bit quick, and he kind of tips it in the air, and it's picked off. They run it down to about the nine-yard line or seven-yard line, and they punch it in. It's 21-3 at the half. And everybody's going to the concession stand thinking, wow, this is in the bag. This, this Atlanta team can't come back mm-hmm. on this Ram team. We got too much. There was a big moment in the game, guys, in the second half. And I don't know if you guys took notice of it, but the Rams went on a long drive. After Atlanta, um, the score was 28-3. Uh, Atlanta went down, scored, made it 28-10. And it's late third quarter, and the Rams are driving. Actually, it's early fourth quarter. Rams are driving, uh, and they're putting together a nice drive. And they get down to the Falcon seven-yard line first and goal. They go four, they go three downs, can't get it in, and are forced to kick a field goal. I thought that was a defensive stand right there that kind of changed the momentum. And I know that we're going to point to the turnovers that changed momentum. I thought that was a moment people are going to forget about, but you held them at the seven and made them kick a field goal. And that was kind of the first time they'd gotten down there where you you'd kind of put up some kind of resistance. Next thing you know, Atlanta gets the ball most of the the length of field scores a touchdown. Then all of a sudden things start happening, right? You get the block punt for a touchdown. You get, uh, you know, the Punch ball's out. dropped out. Now all of a sudden you got a chance to win the football game. But that was a moment right there that I thought was pretty key that will be overlooked. And I think it will be something Dean Peens points to is, okay, this is about playing for four quarters, and this is what we're talking about because this team exemplified that in this this weekend. You were, you were out. I'm sure there was a lot of Falcon fans that might have turned the TV off and left. Next thing you know, they get in the car and they turn turn us on on the radio and find out the score is 31-25. And what the hell happened? You know, <laughs> it's a four quarter game and it was a four quarter game across the league. And I thought Atlanta showed that guts that they're going to show every weekend is they're going to play 60 minutes. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. And, and so, Dave, let's let's kind of talk about some of the things that we we just talked about with the red zone issues, third down uh, turnovers. So the easy thing is, yeah, don't turn the ball over, uh, convert on third down. Right. It's it's a lot more difficult than that arch. So let's let's talk about what can Atlanta move forward and what can they improve on this week to make it a successful trip and win on the back half of this West Coast trip to get a victory over Seattle. Yeah, you guys made a good point on Kyle's route against with London when London scores. I talked to Kyle specifically yesterday about what he's doing. I mean, people would look at him and say, wow, you just had one of the maybe the second greatest or greatest uh, rookie year of a tight end of all time. I mean, you put it up against Mike Ditka's, right? Uh, All-time great rookie tight end performance. 
he's he's good. He his 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 uh, bread his bed's been made, right? No. He talked about some of the routes that he needed to improve on, some of the opportunities that Arthur's trying to dial up for him to get him one on one, and some of those opportunities have gone away simply because his routes haven't been very good. He's 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 still trying to work on running past. He's such a physically dominating dude that he just kind of runs through people sometimes to get himself open or just uses his body size when the precision of his route, as you guys just described on the London touchdown, will help him get more opportunities, get the ball come his way, create more separation for Mariota to get him the football. I think that's number one. It's attention to details, guy. We talk about it all the time. We talked about little things last week. You know, in a screen play, if you get the ball outside, there's a one particular screen play where Drake catches the ball outside wide. It's blocked perfectly. But Drake hesitates a little bit and doesn't quite get up the field, and it only nets about an eight-yard play. When had he hit the seam, you had two kickout blocks. Good job by Wilkinson to peel it back and, and pin the guy inside. There's a lane there. There's a big play. So those are the kind of things that I think young players like Pitts and London and all these guys are going to learn from that it bodes well. They're they're making some plays, but there's bigger plays to be made, and I think they understand it. And that's why I went go back to what I said at the beginning. This is a smart football team. These are young guys that are intelligent, that are listening to the coaching, that I think it's going to it's gonna translate. Now, we want it as Falcon fans to translate right now, and hopefully this weekend against Seattle you can get that done. DJ, he talked a little bit about the Falcons' X's and O's. Switch gears a little bit and tell us a little bit about Seattle. What you see from the Seattle Seahawks this year, strengths, weaknesses, obviously no more Russell Wilson. He's now in Denver. But what type of, of challenges – does Seattle pose that Atlanta needs to be prepared for? Well, I think it's similar to where you just came from. It starts with the environment you're in. Um, when you play an environment in Seattle, um, I don't know if fans have been there now, but it's a loud environment. They get going. Everybody knows it's all about the 12s and all that kind of stuff. And that's a big part of the ball game. If you allow those guys to, to have an effect on the game, it could hurt you. And I, I think one thing that we've stressed the last two weeks – are things that stall out drives or things that hurt you within a drive, like false starts or jumping off sides. Things like that can get that crowd into it but also can affect the ball game. So I think going into it, you have to know the environment and absolutely understand that you have to, your focus has to be a little bit different in a place like this. Um, Seattle's a, a team, obviously, you just mentioned no Russell Wilson. Uh, everything is running through Geno Smith right now. Geno Smith had a really good first game. All the hype with him and Russell coming back in Denver. He ended up winning that ball game. He actually made a bunch of big plays in that game. Mm-hmm. He was accurate. He was efficient. He pushed the ball down the field, used his legs that time. So Geno has been around for a while. This guy is a guy who's a, a veteran of this league and will understand uh, what it takes to win ball games. Didn't have the game they wanted this past week. Uh, San Francisco kind of took it to him. But this is a, a team that still has a bunch of playmakers on it. Rashad Penny is a is a tough runner. Kenneth Walker, uh, I, I'm sure you guys know him pretty well from, from Michigan State. Really tough runner uh, out the backfield. Uh, Tyler Lockett, been around for a while, done yep. it for a long time. Yep. The big physical guy on the outside, big <laughs> DK Metcalf. He's going to pose a, a big issue for, you know, our secondary understanding where he's at. And he's a take the top off. He's a, you know, a screen guy. He's a, a physical specimen as well. So this offense is going to be one that you have to make sure you, you, you know where these guys are and account for them because they can hurt you if you give them the opportunity. So this is going to be a, a fun environment to be in, but it's similar to every other ball game. You got to take care of you first. Yep. And if you don't do that, and obviously, uh, they'll hurt you uh, as any team will in the National Football League. But this will be a game that Seattle will come in with the same amount of confidence. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, they took one on the chin last week. But they're, they're going to build off what they did in that, that first game and say, hey, we got a chance to be a good football team as well. And we know Pete Carroll is a guy who uh, doesn't lack any confidence as well. He have his team ready to go. Yeah, DJ, you talked a little bit about it. Um, you guys know I spent the last two years of my career in Seattle. And um, it is one of the – special places as far as fan experiences go. I mean, the the Seattle Seahawks fans love their Seahawks. They love their team. They come packed. They come loud. No matter what time of day it is, they're going to show up and they're going to be ready to support their team. And Dave, I want to kind of go back to you and I'll start this conversation out because the last thing we'll cover here is the fact that this is a West Coast trip. Atlanta's not making the trip back home. Right. As Dave talked about it, they're going to be working out at the University of Washington this week. I did the same type of deal I believe it was my second year in the league, but we played a back-to-back against the San Francisco 49ers and, of course, the then Oakland Raiders. We trained at Stanford through the week, 
and I think a lot of people would say, well, how do you do that when you don't have your locker room? You don't mm. have your normal training room. You don't have your comforts of training at home. And I would always just go back and say, guys are professionals now. Like this is their job. job yeah. So you can't go out there and make an excuse. I don't have my regular training table. Yeah. I don't have my locker stool to sit on. <laughs> so I don't feel comfortable. This is your job. Now <laughs> your job is to go on the practice field and get prepared and be able to go out on the field and push your best foot forward and help this team win a mm. football game. Arch talk a little bit about the experiences because you're not coming home either. You're going to spend the week in a hotel room and things will get kicked off uh, for sure. Next week is our, excuse me, tomorrow as Atlanta gets on the practice field, but some of the differences that they're going to have to go through this week training out on the West and, Coast. And you look quite comfortable there too, Arch. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, you're sweet. I know. <laughs> yeah, I brought my chair with me. So yeah, <laughs> no, I, uh, and, and Ra is, is as good as Rack described that scenario, there are guys on their team that I don't care how professional they are because they don't have their stool <laughs> or a pain in the butt. I'll tell you that right now. There's the, oh, what are, you, what are you talking about? The, do I got to walk that far to get in the cold tub? Give me a break. Go get in the cold tub. <laughs> so as much as, as much as Rack is trying to paint this professional scenario, there are a couple pains in the asses that they're going to have to deal with. There's no question about that. But – it, it does galvanize a team from certain to a certain extent because you're on the same area all the time. Okay. There's not any family on the trip. It's just the guys and the guys are together. Uh, it, it, when you got a young football team, I think it goes a long way to helping those guys grow together. Some of these guys haven't known each other very long and that helps in that regard. But in the, in the, the aspect of what rack was talking about as a professional. Yeah. You, you've got a facility workout in. You respect the facility. You're working over at Washington. Their facility is, is as good as college facilities you can have in the country. They've got all the bells and whistles. So you're not going to go wanting, right? They're going to have a nice field to practice on. They're going to have training rooms. They're going to have all that stuff uh, at their disposal. So they're going to be able to have some things that, that are like home, albeit it's not exactly yours. Just to reiterate this building that they're going to play in, uh, I played in the old kingdom, okay, and it was one of the hardest places to play anywhere. Much like the Superdome in, Atlanta, in New Orleans, um, the the sound would reverberate off and come back down. I remember my first pass in the game, Kenny easily picked me off. I was trying to throw a little sail route to Billy White Shoes Johnson. He picked off my first pass, and that place went berserk, okay? <laughs> and they stayed berserk the entire game. So. The 12s is relatively a new thing. They've been the 12s since they put the put the team here <laughs> way back in the mid-70s, okay? It's a good and very difficult environment to play in. Um, it'll be a fun game. To talk about Seattle real quickly, for my two cents worth, they want to run the football. They have not been able to run the ball. They ran the ball for 75, I think, against Denver. They ran for, I think, 35 yards this last weekend. I think they'll get back to trying to run the football a little bit. I think that bodes well. Atlanta, I think, will swell up against the run. But I, I'm not worried about traveling and being on the road. I've done it before like you have, Rack. Stayed in L.A. and then went up to play San Francisco. Um, things went good in game one and didn't go good in game two and vice versa. So there's no real remedy to it. A lot of coaches lose different philosophies. But I think the core idea is that you stay out here, you get acclimated to the time zone, and then you kind of grow a little bit as a team. And I think if there's any team in the league that's young enough, this is a benefit. This is a trip that will benefit the Falcons. DJ, did you see when we first started this how he was a little cranky? Uh -huh. It's like if he had that night mm -hmm. of sleep where the pillow was too flat. Uh -huh. He couldn't get the shower <laughs> temperature right what in the hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what? You got to use all four for he's one, sitting, don't you, yeah, He's yeah. sitting on that hotel desk chair right now that's getting really flat. You can see that he's not very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We've seen him move a couple times. Yeah, yeah. so Dave, <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and let you sign off, and you can go get something more comfortable. Go get a coffee, a sandwich, whatever it is. Actually, Actually, it's still fairly breakfast time over there. So go go get you a breakfast sandwich or something, and hopefully you'll be in better shape. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Good to be with you all. All right, that's going to wrap it up Arch. here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us as we kind of recap the Rams game, get ready for the Seattle Seahawks this next weekend as Arch will stay out on the West Coast. We'll uh, we'll welcome him back home next week. and we uh, you, Hopefully be recapping a victory and how they are able to uh, – <laughs> 
to move forward from, from some of the things that plagued them in weeks Let's past. Let's go get a dub, Let's man. go get Let's a go. victory. I'm Derek Rackley. This is Dave Archer right here on the screen. That's DJ Shockley. Thanks so much for joining us. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, review on Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, and YouTube. This is the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.